Welcome back, everyone, to The Xamarin Show. I'm your host, James Montemayo, and I'm so freaking excited because right now I have Donna, yes. Program Manager of Azure Functions, which, besides Xamarin, is my favorite product that we have at Microsoft. I, awesome. I've said it multiple times to a lot of people, but Azure Functions, I it blew my mind the first time I saw it, the first time I used it. I used it this week to set up like this whole cool Slack integration craziness thing, and I'm so excited to have Donna on to talk about Azure Functions for mobile applications. Now, people may not know who you are, Donna, so maybe introduce yourself a little so, bit. So, I'm a program manager on the Azure Functions team, as James said, uh, and I'm responsible for the developer experience, which is the Visual Studio tooling and the portal experience. So, basically, what I'm going to be demoing today is what I work on. Awesome. So, well, so maybe people don't know what Azure Functions are, because yes. I think that was a, always the hardest thing for me, is trying to wrap my head around, because everyone kept saying, Serverless, serverless yep. compute. So yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe can you tell tell me what is an Azure function? All right. Well, first let me explain what serverless is. Yeah. If you're like me, when you heard the term serverless, you're like, well, that's a stupid word. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, wait, there's no servers, and what am I going to run it on? Uh, and then the light bulb moment for me was when uh, one of my colleagues said, hey, no, it's like wireless. Wireless. There are wires, you know, in the router. Yeah. In the in the access point, but not for you as a user. Got for it. you as a user, there aren't any servers. So, serverless usually means three things. Number one is no, it's an abstraction of servers. So, your code runs somewhere mm -hmm. for usually a short period of time, like five or ten minutes, and you don't have a machine that you could even remote into or, or look at. You could have one execution run on one machine, another execution on a completely different machine. Okay. So, that's completely abstracted from you. The next thing is that it's event-driven and it scales based on events. So that's really important. So an example of an event is a timer. You run around every day, every hour. Uh, HTTP triggers are also events. And then another common event is queues. Okay. And the cool thing about things like queues is that the service can look and see how long the queue is and then mm. add more instances if you're not keeping up. So kind of like insta scale. Exactly. If you will. It scales even faster than app service for HTTP and things like that. Uh, the final point is you pay for only what you use. So let's say you have a function that runs every day for five minutes. Okay. You do not have a VM except for those five minutes, and you only pay for those five minutes. Oh, I like that. Yeah, because the problem is like when I set up a backend for my application, I got a SQL server that's always running. I have yep. an app service that's always running. Yep. I got to pay for both of those. And I can't turn them off because what if someone goes to my website? Exactly. Right? But with the function, you're saying it's basically it's only you're saying it's alive while it's running. So it turns on and turns off. Exactly. Is, is there overhead with that? Like, does it have to, how long it, does it take to? So that's a really good question. So that's usually called cold start. Mm. Cold start is the time that it takes for the function's runtime to start up when no instances are running. Okay. And uh, right now it's in the five second range, but we're doing okay. a lot of work on that uh, to have these kind of instances around that are like placeholders. Mm. And then we'll inject your code dynamically. Oh, cool. And we're seeing um, times in about two second range. Oh, and we're wow. going to improve that further because yeah. even Two seconds for a webhook might be too long. But Got it. Yeah. We're constantly improving that there. Now, what if, and how, how do I pay for it? Do I have to, I go and I, I assume I can go into the portal and there's a bajillion options and there's a function in there. Is there anything that's unique? I'm used to like paying for app service where I have to like pick a plan and stuff like ah, that. Ah, so that's yeah. a really good question. Let's go to the portal. Let's go to the portal. Let's hop over to and the And let's take a look at what the create experience is like. So one of the interesting things about Azure Functions that's different from every other serverless vendor is that we have two different ways that you can run a function app. You can either run it on the serverless plan, which is the default. That's okay. the consumption plan. So to create a function, you go to compute, uh, and then you create function app. Function app. And uh, what you'll see here is the usual fields that you usually see. Here, there's a hosting plan. Mm. And there's two options. There's a consumption plan, which is usually what you want. About 75% of our customers use this. Or you can use an app service plan. If you choose that, you can even pick one that's used by your website. So if you have an app service plan that's underutilized, this is a nice way to get it. Basically, functions for free. Oh, so like I have a, often, I, like I have a mobile app right now mm -hmm. that is connected to a SQL server and I have a little, you know, uh, website that's running. It's essentially just doing the gets and sets for my mobile applications uh, online, offline sync. Sure. So I can just leverage what yep. I'm doing because I already have it there. Yep, exactly. Now, now does that mean that mine's always on then if yes, I pick one? Yes, it uh -huh. is. Uh, by default, it will set, it will create uh, an app that's similar to a web app with a different resource, Got function it. app type, and it will set always on for you. 
Got it. And that's how it processes the triggers. Got it. Now, when you run on a consumption plan, we have a central multi-tenant service called the scale controller. Mm. And that's the thing that's looking at all your triggers and deciding whether or not to wake up your function app and oh, whether or not cool. to scale you out and whether or not to turn off instances. Got it. But you said most people use consumption because that's right. really what's unique, right, is the idea is that if it's just sitting there, I don't really want to pay for exactly. it, right? So you would never really use a, you know, unless you needed it to always be on, but I, the idea I'm assuming is that, hey, I have something that runs every night at midnight to clear out my database. I probably don't need to pay for the other 23 exactly. hours, 59 minutes, right? Exactly. And, and, and is it cheap? It is very cheap. So we are not, our goal here is to make it really easy to use other Azure services. Look at all those zeros yeah, in Yeah, exactly. So there's actually a free grant across your subscription. Mm -hmm. You get, so we have a unit called a gigabyte second. <laughs> Which, right. is, which is new. Uh, now Azure Container Instances also use this. Oh, what cool. it means is how many seconds are you running and how much memory did you consume? Got it. So unlike some other vendors, another aspect that's really unique to us is that we dynamically figure out how much memory you need. On Lambda, for instance, you have to figure out up front, do I want you know, 128 gig, uh, giga, megabytes uh, all the way up to 1.5 gigabytes? Okay. And we have that same top limit, but we figure out for you. And we found that customers were over-provisioning. We, we originally had the first model. We found that customers saved about 75% by having the platform figure it out for you. Oh, got it. Yeah, so there's, everyone wanted to give us all their money. and like, hey, yeah. we don't want your money just exactly. yet. Like, there's this, we can just literally give you tons of stuff for free and actually scale right. this and up for you. And plus, abstract it more. Because if you have to got pick it. memory, that's not so serverless, is I it? I don't know. I don't want to. One time I spun up a, a Linux VM, and I was just like, well, there's like a bajillion options. Right. I figured out which one I needed, but it took me a while. Exactly. Well, it seems what's nice is you can go into the portal, function app, boom, you're up and running in, what, exactly. a few seconds? Exactly. Oh, uh, what I love about functions is that I can write stuff in C Sharp. Yes. And as a C Sharp mobile developer, it makes a lot of sense Absolutely. that there's stuff for mobile apps. But what else does it support? So we also support Node.js, which mm -hmm. is another one of our first class languages, and also F Sharp. Mm -hmm. And then we have a few languages that are preview or experimental, uh, such as Python. Um, we have PowerShell, actually, that's very common for automation scenarios and that kind of thing. Very cool. And we're going to light up new languages soon, so stay tuned for that. Cool. So basically, if you have some code, you can run it in a function. Exactly. That's the goal, right? Exactly. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So what are mobile scenarios? Because you, you talked about queues and HTTP triggers. In the mobile landscape, what are you seeing developers use functions for? So HTTP, definitely. Like, mm -hmm. you always need some kind of a backend. This is, like, basically the lightest weight backend you can have, which is a good fit for mobile applications because you often get very spotty traffic and not very frequently, especially if you're doing something like offline sync, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you can have just an HTTP endpoint that you authenticate against. Okay. I think you even had a blog post about that uh, mm -hmm. when we were in preview. So that's, that's a, a most common scenario. Another one is that you want to do background processing, and you don't want to do it on a customer's device. Got it, yeah. So for instance, uh, you upload a photo. I'll show a demo of that. And you know these cameras on phones are amazing, right? They're huge, huge photos. They give you like five megabyte photos, yeah. which is not great for, for downloading. So yeah. uh, you could have uh, an image resize uh, function, which I'll demo where you know, as soon as a photo goes into blob storage, it triggers and then it resizes mm. it, which will make it much more mobile friendly. That's nice, yeah, because I often have, and one of my plugins, right, is taking a photo, you upload it to blob storage, and you're like, oh, I gotta go write all this stuff, yep. and, or I have to try to process on the, no one on the phone wants to wait. Exactly. So the idea is just like offload. Now, can you use any package? Like, how would you resize the photo? Or yes, can you, you can use, use any NuGet package oh. at all. So that, and I'm using, I'll use the image resizer, which I like, but oh, cool. there's a few others that work just fine. So if I'm uploading, Images or text, if I can use any, because I mean, can I, can I use like cognitive services, absolutely. And OCR stuff? Absolutely, and, absolutely. Oh, cool. So basically, anything that you want to do in Azure is now available to you with this pay per execution programming model. Well, then I guess the nice thing there is like, so since the logic doesn't run on the phone, yep. if once I upload a photo, m my image resize could be, I could do whatever I want afterwards, exactly. right? Like, it's no, I'm no longer limited to just on the device. And you're not limited to that short response time that you want to provide users on a phone. Got it, cool. Yeah. Well, let's see it. I'm ready okay. to see some demos. Let's hop over. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is show you the Visual Studio tooling. Um, let me just show you real quick how to uh, get to the installer and everything for the okay. like that. So you go to documentation, and if you scroll down, you'll see that one of the top things here is serverless functions, because mm -hmm. we are one of the most popular services in Azure. We're quickly growing very quickly. Uh, we only GA'd in, in November of last year, and we're seeing huge growth because of the simplicity of use the ease of using other Azure services. Nice. 
So uh, there's under Quick Starts, there's Create Function Visual Studio. Um, currently, it's available in the Preview channel with Visual Studio Preview 15.3, which is mm -hmm. basically VS Update 3. Got it which is going to be GA'd very soon. And so once that happens, it'll all be included in the Azure workload. Right. Even maybe by the time this is out, we'll yeah, see. That'll yeah, that'll be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, you'll go to this page and maybe it will say something <laughs> different. So the tooling experience is going to be very similar. Um, so what I'm going to do here is show you just the new function project dialog. So basically, you just go into um, Visual C Sharp, you pick Azure Functions, and you get a project. So what that project includes is a file called host.json, okay. which is going to be empty by default. This has a bunch of configuration settings, like how quickly do you want to process queue messages? Um, you know, is there a, you know, a timeout for queues? And a lot of advanced stuff like that. Got but it. it's here for you to edit very easily. Um, then you also get a local settings file. This is used oh. only on your local machine. Oh. And you have to set a value for Azure Web Job Storage if you're using any triggers other than HTTP. So you're saying that I can write an Azure function and I can test it locally yes. on my machine. I don't have to put it in. I, I yes. could just. I don't even have to have an Azure account at this point. I can just. Yes. If you're using HTTP, you don't even need an Azure uh -huh. account. If you're using one of the other triggers, you should add a real Azure account. Got it. So cool. um, that's how it works. And then if you want to add new functions, you just say right click, add new item, and add function. And it's these are the same templates that you see in the portal. Oh, all, cool. all configured for C Sharp. So I have one uh, function I want to show you, which is for image resizing, which oh, cool. is very common in mobile applications, mobile apps, as we yeah. were saying. So what you'll see here is something interesting, and this is specific to our C Sharp programming model. Yes, yeah, so I see you have the same host and local settings. Yes. And then you have this resize image. So it's just a C-sharp file. Exactly. Oh, okay. So I'm going to create a DLL and upload that. And that's going to be more oh. performant because when you use scripting, every time the host restarts, it needs to compile your code, oh. which adds to your cold start. So Got here, it. it's just going to be a DLL, load it, Execute done. Execute it, done. Exactly. That makes sense. So you use attributes to define your function. So you put it, you, this function name attribute on any public method, public static method. And then you put your triggers as attributes as well, which is convenient because you get to see exactly what's going on. Got it. Now, you don't even have to hard code these values. If you put percents around them like this, it will read those values from a local environment variable, either in Azure or locally. Oh, got it. So even though your config is in your code, part of your config is in your code, mm -hmm. you still have a lot of flexibility. Got it. So what this is doing is it's saying whenever there's a new blob in the sample images container, mm -hmm. let's give it the name, name in curlies, and we're going to have th two output bindings, which are going to be the small and medium version of the image. Perfect. And so see how we're using name again? That's because it comes from the previous one. So Got whatever it. it triggered is going to have that value. Uh, so then we're just going to use image resizer. Now, notice this code. Like, I am not using the storage SDK at all, even though mm -hmm. I'm using storage. And yeah. if you look at my usings, I have a few usings. No references to storage, which means it's super easy to get started. You just use streams. So I'm just going to write out oh. to a new stream. And it just knows that yes. this was output to a blob because exactly. there was a blob trigger, and these are blobs that are being output. Exactly. Whoa, cool. So this is the power of bindings. So oh. it's that easy to consume other Azure services. So there's bindings for Service Bus, DocDB, or Cosmos DB now, um, and you know all kinds of other services. So, so I, I take a photo, I upload it to blob storage, and boom, it's resized in literally four lines of code. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's crazy. Yes. Um, so let us set a breakpoint and see how this is working. Um, let's actually do it on the last line of code after it's done everything. OK. So let's just F5. And the one thing that I had to do here is I mentioned that local connection string. Yeah. So in lo if we look at local settings JSON, uh, what we'll see is that I put in my uh, storage connection string, which got I got it. from Storage Explorer. Got it. So we can see the host is running. So this is the uh, container. And let us. So I found, uh, I figured since this is Xamarin, I should have a Xamarin themed photo. So let's upload this image. So this is. A very large image of monkeys, which Boom. are just adorable. Adorable, love it. I mean, um, I've taken that photo. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, so we can see here it's 250 kilobytes, which is actually pretty small. Yeah. But um, the dimensions are pretty big. So now we can see we set a breakpoint and the function ran. If we look at 
our other containers, we can see the same file name, mm. and the medium one is only 65K, and the small one is 44K, 44. and the dimensions are a lot smaller. Nice. Means that you can put it in a mobile app more easily. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and also, you can then scale based on your device type. Absolutely. Like, oh, am I on an iPad? Well, I want a higher res photo, but I'm yep. on an iPhone. I want a lower res yep. photo. You could dynamically control, control that. that. Very cool. Awesome. So literally just a few lines of code up and running, and then this is that that server uh, storage explorer, which I use all the time, which yes. I love. Very cool. Um, so imagery sizing, what else can we do? Let's do do we have any like more yes, complex Yes, let's scenarios? do something a little bit more complex. So here I have a website. Uh, I haven't created a mobile app in a while, so that's why it's a website and not a mobile app. But, uh, what but it, it does, could be a mobile app. It could app. be a mobile app. In fact, audience, <laughs> I challenge you, the first person, or actually anyone, to take the sample and add a mobile app for it, we will retweet from the Azure Functions Twitter account. There you go, very so, cool. Uh, so what this is, is uh, a site that sells cat products, and customers can upload photos of their cat using the product. Now, this is customer okay. content, so you know people are gonna upload all kinds of offensive things, like photos of dogs, for instance. Yeah. People are great, but sometimes <laughs> you may exactly. pick the wrong photo. So we can't just, we can't yeah. just show everything willy-nilly, and human moderation is time-consuming. Got it, yeah. So what this site does is whenever you upload an image, um, I'm going to pick um, this adorable photo of my cat. It's my cat, Moxie. Um, whenever you upload a new image, it uploads the photo to blob storage, and okay. it writes the review text to document DB, it's Cosmos DB, and it sets the status to pending, because it's waiting for the function to execute. To execute. Now, the function only runs on my local machine, so right now it's still gonna be in that queue. So let's look at the queue contents here. Um, so the contents are not super interesting, but just notice there's two fields. There's a blob name, and a document ID. Oh, because there's actually the blob image and then the document, which yes. is kind of the status, I assume, and then also the, this is my cat moxie. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So now what we're going to do in the function is mm -hmm. we're going to bind to those parameters. So this is one of the coolest features of functions that I, I love. So here, notice I'm using percents for queue name. Uh, if mm -hmm. we look at our local settings file, we'll see that I have, I've set the queue name here. So you can even customize what queue you're listening on. Oh, cool. And then uh, this is where that blob, so basically here I have curly, in curly is I have blob name. The reason that works is I have a POCO that I've defined called review request item. Got it. So it automatically gets serialized into this type because that's yep. what the, the, the payload looked like in JSON. Got it. So I have a document ID and a blob name field. Now I can use those field, those properties in other bindings. Oh, cool. So here, I have a stream that is bound to the actual blob that was the ID in that queue message. Oh, cool. Nice. And same with the document ID. So without using, again, I don't have to use the Cosmos DB SDK. I don't have to use the storage SDK. All the data is there for me. Makes sense. Very cool. And then if you had any other custom data, basically, in that, you, you would create that little uh, data structure yes. that you would put. So exactly. I mean, yeah, and it cool. would automatically get serialized. So cool. let me show you what this function is doing visually. So I wrote, uh, as a hackathon project, I wrote a bindings visualizer because I give a lot of demos and I like to explain how everything is all wired up. So you can either upload an image, uh, sorry, upload a zip file with your binding information or mm. point it to a GitHub repo okay. and it will visualize it for you and ah. it gives you an SVG that you can download. That's cool. So here, notice that we have a queue and a blob. It's showing document DB as output, even though it's both input and output. And our function is review image and text. Got it, cool. So if you had a more complicated example, this is one that Chris Anderson has, which is an exponential scale sample, Whoa. which it makes, it does exponential scale by creating two queue messages for each <laughs> queue message that it received. So this actually will cost you a lot of money if you leave it running too long. Yeah. Uh, but you can see that even though it's doing a bunch of stuff, you can see that it has a queue and uh, the exponential scale function is what's creating all these queue messages. Very cool. So uh, this will, I recommend you use this. Go to functions-visualizer.azure websites. Website. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. So uh, let's go back to our code and I'm going to set a breakpoint. So what I'm going to do now is, like I said, we need to moderate this. So people mm -hmm. can put offensive words in the text. Yep. So we can use the Bing, uh, sorry, the cognitive services content moderation APIs. Oh yeah, cool. And also the image moder uh, the image analysis APIs, the vision APIs. Oh yeah. So we can look at the image and if it doesn't have a cat in it, we'll say sorry. No cat. No, no go. No go, can't yeah. have that. So what I'm gonna do here is now F5. 
Now, remember, there's a queue message waiting for me because mm -hmm. we just looked at it in Storage Explorer. So as soon as I run this, I should see my breakpoint being hit. Oh, yeah, because we already uploaded the image that's yep. running locally. So this is a nice way, essentially, of at this point, the website's running locally, this is running locally, and essentially what you want to do is debug locally and then upload to Azure exactly. later, right? Got now, it. the cool thing is that uh, you get to work independently of each other. So if someone else writes the web page, they get it all working, they're writing to Azure in their yeah. queue, and I can develop locally and make oh, sure it cool. works end to end. Very nice. So see, here we can see there's a new queue message yep. detected. Uh, and the function is running. Nice. And it doesn't quite have it. There's a keyboard, I think, so it thinks it's a cat sitting in front of a laptop. <laughs> uh, but it's pretty close. But if we look and we see contains cat is true. true. Whoa, cool. And um, if we look at the result, what I'm doing is I'm using the description. And I look at the tags. Oh. And we can see here that, see, it has keyboard, mouse, kitchen, all these keywords. And so what I'm doing is, as long as cat is in the first uh, five tags, then I will approve the image. And that was just kind of arbitrary. Very cool. So this is actually a printer. So I'm going to say a printer. And I'm going to add some exclamation points. Because I'm debugging, yeah. I can change, change uh, it. the content. Very so cool. let's go to this review. We refresh. A cat oh, sitting in front cool. of a printer. Nice. Very cool. And you didn't even have to do anything because it yes. automatically just, boom, uploaded it. The website's looking at it. And then, boom, exactly. it's done. So now let's upload cool. the monkeys again. Uh, I All actually right. haven't seen what, how it will caption this. So that, this will be interesting. Monkeys. This is actually some cats. Let's try to, <laughs> let's try to confuse it. it. Yeah. Um, and the function triggers right away. And it tells us, it, <laughs> wow, it's wow. pretty accurate. Whoa. A group of stuffed animals sitting next to a teddy, teddy bear. bear. <laughs> so the That's monkeys look like a teddy bear. That's pretty good. So let's continue and refresh, and it's rejected. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the beautiful part here is that literally these images could be coming from anywhere, yep. whether it's from the website, from a mobile app, from somewhere else. That who knows, right? Any IoT device that's sitting there taking photos Absolutely. over and over again that's analyzing this. Absolutely. Uh, it, that's been, and then literally nothing is happening on the phone or website. Everything yep. is just happening in this function. And it, and it spun up and then done. Just yep. up and down and up and then done. And that's yep, it. Yep. If you get somebody putting, you know, your app goes out in the store and it's really popular, yeah. you might get a lot of photos being uploaded. The function yeah. will scale up automatically. Yeah. And the cool part here then is then, could you then take this photo at this point and then trigger the other Azure function to yes, resize it when could. we're done? So can you chain these things you together? You could. You could actually. Uh, Say like only when approved, then yes. resize it. Also you could. You could add right? a new queue message, for instance, Whoa, to do that. That's the other cool. thing you could do is uh, tie this into a workflow using something like Logic App. So you mm. could say maybe if the confidence interval is not that high, let me cats in the like top ten instead of top five. Yeah. You want to have a human approve it. So you could add, Very cool. uh, you know, trigger a workflow which actually sends an email to a human that clicks a button and approves the image. Very cool. Awesome. All right. Anything else you want to show us in this thing? This thing is amazing. Uh, let's just look at App Insights data. Oh, sure. Because uh, it's an app service, right? Yes, so exactly. Technically it's, a, technically, it's an app service, right? Uh, it, uh, yes, actually. Okay. So if you look at your consumption plan in the portal, you'll see that it's an app service plan with Got a special it. SKU that is only able to be used by functions. Got it. Uh, but the way I did this is, so there's uh, two things here. First off, um, if you just add an App Insights instrumentation key to mm. any function app, you will automatically get our telemetry. So maybe people don't even know what App Insights is. Oh, so that's a good question. Let's let's uh, let's get dig into. It. So Application Insights is a tool for monitoring your application, uh. and it will show you all kinds of events, and you can filter on them to see how your app is performing. Got so it. once you've deployed it, you want to know okay, what's going on? Is stuff working? Maybe you'll get some complaint from a customer who says it's not working. So what you could do is go into the analytics portal, and this mm. is where the real power is. And here you can write queries um, with the SQL-like language, and it has a bunch of IntelliSense. So you can filter on the different properties. So here, our functions run a few times. So we should have the built-in metric. So yeah, oh, cool. you can see the average duration, the max duration, number of successes and failures of the actual um, function running. Oh, nice. Um, and then we have moderation result. This was custom um, a custom metric that we logged, which is super easy. So I just have basically two lines of code to log this. Oh, cool. So I have analyze review and then moderation result. So you can see here I have moderation result, and I say each time I log what's happening. 
So now suppose that you get a customer who's like, oh, I'm putting this image in. It's not working. This is when I did it. You could actually go in and see what's happening. Oh, cool. Maybe there's an exception. This will show you the exception. Um, the other thing you can do is see how fast you're processing events oh. and the server events and the failed requests. Here we don't have any failed requests. Then you can also see a dependency graph, which tells you how everything is all hooked up. So oh, cool. the website is calling into App Insights, right. which is calling to blob storage right. and queue storage, and you can see the latencies. Very and if cool. there were any errors, here you would see, like see here it says 0% failures. failures. If there were failures, it would show you like an extra stack trace. Cool. And then you could take, could you, can you take that App Insights then? So I see this flow from mobile to functions to App Insights to monitor this entire backend. Can you then take that and put it in like a Power BI? And yes, then do absolutely. data visualization absolutely. on you it? You can also Amazing. do monitoring, App Insights monitoring on the mobile app as well. And then mm. you could use a correlation ID for the request that you then pass to the backend. Let's say you're oh, doing cool. HTTP, that's the easiest case. Yeah. You would pass in that ID to the backend or put in the queue message. So then you could look at a single request and see exactly what's happening. Got it, cool. What does this function look like in the portal? Do you have do you have it here? Like yes. so because we've just seen Visual Studio. What does it look like when it's actually in the in the portal itself, I guess? So because it's a DLL, um, do I, I have a different one that's also pre-compiled. But what it's going to show me, this is my coder card sample, okay. which is a Pokemon card generator. Nice. Um, which you could also do as a mobile app. You could have customers take a photo and then get a Pokemon card. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, so if you look at here, we have our functions listed. Let's see, functions, proxies, and slots. Right. So proxies are a way to route um, from one place, one to, place another. to another. In fact, if we go to the site route, we've customized it to actually show a static web page that's hosted in Azure storage. Mm. It'll just take a second because my function is cold. And so you can upload a photo. Oh, cool. Um, do I have any? I can upload a photo here. Um, oh, there we go. Pictures. Oh, here we go. So <laughs> we have Satya. And um, this will generate the function. I uh, use a function to generate it, and <laughs> we can look at our awesome. thing. Uh, we actually demoed this to him, which <laughs> was, was fun. I wasn't in the demo, but uh, my cool. coworkers were. So uh, where am I? So I want to go back to the function app that I was on. There we go. Yeah. So slots are also a way to deploy. Uh, so you can deploy like staging slots. Exactly. That's oh, exactly got it, what cool. it is. And the main function. There's a. Are these each separate functions? Yes. Yeah, so I have generate card, card, request image processing, mm -hmm. uh, and setting. So generate card is a queue trigger um, that then writes out to the output blob. You can see everything it's doing here. So because it's a DLL, it's not going to show me the DLL body itself. Got it. That makes but sense. But I can go into monitor and I can see that. It ran recently. Um, so this is like the built-in monitor view, but it's not oh, as cool. rich as Application Insights. Got it. So you can see it ran a minute ago, and it wrote to card output, so I could go and look if I wanted to. Can you also have it, so in this card instance, right, it returned a card, and then can the function, can I await on the function? Let's, let's say I make an HTTP trigger. Mm. Can I await for it to like come back? That That's a very good question. Yeah, Let like, me tell you Because how does my answer. mobile app know that it's done, I guess, is my question. Well, there's two things you can do here, but the way the the the, the, the hottest way to do this is use durable New hotness. So uh, you, what you can do is do an async HTTP call with durable mm -hmm. functions. So okay. what happens is um, there's a I think you can return a 201 with a location. Ah. So what you can do then is uh, what it does under the covers. You could do this yourself today. Yeah. Under the covers, what this does is it automatically creates a queue message for you ah. and a queue that you can trigger on. So what you do here is you can write an orchestrator function. Um, like this, and then you can await it. Ah. Like here, you can actually, if you want to call one function to have it call another, you wouldn't want an HTTP to call one function calling another because yeah. that's less durable. Got it. Uh, so here, you can um, call have one function call another, oh, cool. and under the covers, it'll create a queue message for you. You can do fan in and fan out scenarios, or just uh, one one function calling another. Cool. So that that's the way to do it. All right, I got I definitely have to check that yes. out. That makes sense because that's what I'm kind of thinking is. I want to take that photo and upload it, but then I want to get the results back and, yeah. and orchestrate that together. Yeah, yeah, cool. absolutely. Awesome. Um, so, so that's what it looks like in the portal. Um, but if you look at a function that's scripting, then you can actually edit that as well. So these function apps contain multiple functions, yes, right? Generally. So you have 
a grouping, like this is my apps functions yes. types of functionality. So the rule of thumb is anything that you want to deploy together, mm -hmm. you would put in one function app. It's kind of its own microservice. Got it. Uh, if you wanted to deploy one function separately from another, you would put them in separate apps. Cool. Awesome. So here, for instance, this one's C-sharp. You could edit it in the portal because it's a script. Oh, got it's it. It's C-sharp scripting. So the scripting one, there's some different advantages yes. and some disadvantages compared to the, the DLL, which we saw yeah. earlier, which is the DLL that's being executed. Yes, cool. exactly. Awesome, Don. This has been awesome. Yeah. I love it. So much awesome. So this is why I love Azure Functions. You can do crazy, ridiculous things with it, and then it costs you nothing, which is great. Yes. <laughs> which is awesome. Well, Donna, thank you so much for coming thank you. on. Um, uh, I cannot wait to have you back on to talk about more Azure Functions. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So until next time, I'm James Montemagna. This has been The Xamarin Show. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. It's over there or over there. Who knows where it's at? Hit it so you can keep up to date on all the latest and greatest happening. Until next time, thanks for watching.